On today's show, we just dive straight in and do three dreams. And one of them we do feature length style. I love that where we take a long dream, but we break it down so that you can understand the buildup of the dream and what it all means. Welcome to the Dream Interpretation Podcast with Michael and Sandy. Hello, welcome everybody. This is another half hour of us eavesdropping on the very personal communication between the spirit world and souls on the earth journey. That's what you are, a soul on an earth journey. And that's why we focus on dreams. If you want to know what you're meant to be doing in your life at this moment in time right now, then look no further than your dreams. Through analyzing your dreams, I reveal your potential and the obstacles you need to overcome. That's super important. I'm very specific. I tell you the superpowers that you have, what would make you magnificent, and the bumps in life that are holding you back. But these bumps are not in the way. They are the way. To get your dream analyzed on our show, go to dream-analysis.com forward slash podcast. Fill in the form that's there, if you find one, or email your dream to radio show at dream-analysis.com. And thank you to everybody who sends in dreams. They are the lifeblood of this show. Yes, very, very important. And we had a fabulous webinar a week ago. And then last Wednesday, we had Pat do an excellent demonstration of her channeling ability for groups. And today, or actually yesterday, we started our first channeling class. And so I'm so excited. It went really well. Is there anything you want to talk about, Michael, about that? And do we have anything new upcoming? (laughs) All right, Sandy. Let's dive straight into the dreams. All righty. So the first one that we're looking at is titled Snow Dream, and it's from Sophie. The dream started with an image of Christmas socks. The image was a little cartoonish, and the socks were moving a little like they were dancing. They were knitted and a little bit above ankle length. I think they had light brown and white colors and also red bows at the ankles. I think they also had a green and yellow pattern around the ankle area. They were kind of like socks, but also like Christmas stockings, the kind get filled with presents on Christmas Eve. Then I saw my feet wearing those socks, and I was walking in the snow with just the Christmas socks on, no shoes. Okay, that's interesting, Michael. (laughs) All right. So... I really like this dream. We're starting off bite-sized and then we're going to get into a really long dream. Um, But this is like Christmas socks are about birth. Christmas is about birth. Um, And even she says that they were cartoonish. That also brings us back to childhood. So two symbols that bring us back to early childhood and birth. Um, But then she says uh, they were the type of socks that you would get Christmas presents in. And then later on, she says she's the one in the socks because she's got her feet in them. So really, the dream is asking her to recognize her own precious nature, that she is a gift. And of course, for you to have this dream, it means you were not made feel that way in childhood. So that's the sad part. So this dream is really an antidote to the cold welcome that she got at birth. And the snow at Christmas is really what emphasizes the cold welcome. Uh, But that's it. Well, also, um, are we talking, there's a lot of colors in here. We've got light brown and white colors. You've got red bows and green and yellow patterns. So that's a lot of different colors. Can you like give us some info? What's going on with the colors? Yes. Well, uh, it's red and white. So light brown is is practical. It's like, okay, your start to life is practical, even though it doesn't seem good. You are a gift. You are precious, et cetera, et cetera. Life is precious. And then she said, there was red bows at the angle, white colors and red. So white and red are really the best color combination you can ever see in a dream. So it's about joy and uh, hope for the future. Um, so it's really saying like things are going to get better. They're definitely going to get better. And then we have other things in there that are all about expression of the heart because we have green. Yellow is about um, being intellectual. And she's working on healing issues around mom at this moment in time. So it's a lot of colors. Maybe someday we will do a show that is just about colors. They don't mm. sometimes come across as very intuitive. When you work with them a lot, they do, but <laughs> it makes sense. But um, she mentions colors in all her dreams, and I love it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, the good news is we have another dream from her, and this one's titled Art Symbols. Once again, it's from Sophie. All I remember from this dream was an image of three symbols that looked like symbols from Native American art. 
The symbols were all the same, made up of lines stacked on each other and half circle in the middle of the top line with a round part up and the open part down. I think there were some other elements to the symbols, but I can't quite remember. The first of the three symbols was on the left and the second one on the right. The third one was under the second one and almost aligned under, right under, but slightly further to the left. Oh my goodness, Michael. <laughs> All right. So this one is really straightforward. The interpretation is just oh simply this. She is prophetic. There you go. What? That's the whole no. analysis. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that makes no sense. Okay. You've got to explain a lot more about that. And you know what's that. funny? She said the same thing. Um, so why does it mean this? And we've seen this a number of times. In fact, we were uh, out with a friend of yours, a uh, colleague from work years ago, Sandy, and he gave a similar dream where he was looking at this big wall and there was uh, hieroglyphs or something like hieroglyphs going, mm -hmm. stretching all the way in the distance to the left and all the way to the right. And he could look at these and if he looked at them, they made no sense. But if he focused, he was able to decipher them and he was really intrigued by that. And he was moving along the line, left to right, you know, looking at the various different symbols. And so I explained to her, look, this is just a characteristic of how prophecy shows up in a dream. And we had this in a dream last week where we showed hexagons on the roof of uh, the of a dome of a building. Right. And it just is the nature of it. It's like you're looking at the matrix. You're looking at the construct and sacred geometry and the various different things that make up the reality or the illusion that is our reality. And this dream shows it in spades. However, if you're not used to this kind of symbol, you'd be like, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, when I explained to her like that, it, the way it normally comes and the focusing, she's like, OK, that, yeah, that totally is a theme in my dreams. I have lots of dreams like that where I'm able to look at symbols and then I can figure them out. And they're all in this line. So I just thought I'd include it because we don't often get prophetic dreams and everybody wants them. Everybody's like, hey, you know what's meant to happen? Have you seen any dreams about that? Uh, and so on. But prophecy is a very rare gift. People have it. But it is rare, rarer than than you think, because you don't need to be prophetic. If you can channel and talk to your guides or angels, then they can tell you what's coming for you. You don't need to be prophetic, you know. Wow, that was very interesting, Michael. The fact that you knew that was prophetic right away, I would have gotten nothing out of that dream. I was like, it's gibberish. So I can understand why she felt the same way. <laughs> Now we're moving on to a very long dream. And so we're gonna break it into different sections. So I'm excited to see how this dream builds. And so this one's titled Agent and Daughter, and it's from Jane. A young girl and her dad, he wanted to destroy something. Some major destruction was going, on, going to happen. My friend, Justina, found herself close to this daughter. I don't know who she was. I was the agent who was supposed to prevent this destruction to destroy his plans. All right. So dad was destructive. We know it's about dad because it's about a young girl and her dad. So it's about the dreamer when she was a young girl and her dad. So dad was destructive. He's going to destroy something major. We, we see this coming up over and over throughout the dream. And then it becomes very specific what he's going to destroy. And so Justina, it's a name, it's a pun. This is I want justice to be leveled at dad are served on dad. And that's what she's going to do. I'm going to be the agent of change. So it's really good. She's working on herself. So to see this coming up in a dream says that um, I am now looking at something that was very dangerous because she talks about it being dangerous later on uh, in my child to me in my childhood. Uh, and it's all about my dad being destructive. Wow. OK, next part. This girl was not aware of what was happening, that she was the daughter of a criminal. He was doing a lot of bad things behind her back. She didn't know it. His plans, I'm not sure now, was to annihilate something related to the earth, nature. It was definitely going to be very devastating. Woo. So, okay, he's not really going to destroy the earth. This is like despicable me or something like that. Uh, but from the child's perspective, it really means that dad is going to destroy my world. And this is how it shows up symbolically. Wow. So just just to be clear, would this be considered like a nightmare dream? Uh, no, these dreams, like where you're kind of like an agent like James Bond, 
or a secret agent, they feel really good. They feel like I'm super important and I'm on this mission. But it really comes out from the fact like what makes it feel good for the person is generally that they are incognito. They're hiding themselves from everybody else. And that's really what they want to get away with. Um, I mean, there's more to it than that. It's generally not good because this, and we're going to cover this later in the dream, probably even right now, but uh, hiding yourself is not a good thing. Okay. So next part, my partner and I were tasked with shutting down this whole bad idea. I knew this girl wouldn't trust me because she believes her dad. So I had to be incognito. It was very dangerous for me because her dad had a lot of different contacts and highly developed technologies. All right. So there we go. I hide myself because I have to be incognito. Nobody can recognize me. And this, of course, then is connected to dad. I don't let people see the real me because of issues with my dad. And then she says that the girl, she knew the girl wouldn't trust her. So the girl, of course, is her in childhood. So this is her set way of saying in a dream, I don't trust people, but it's because of what happened to me in childhood. Wow. Okay, let's continue on. Hopefully there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Okay. I had to turn off the location on my phone so he couldn't recognize any signal from my phone when I was already near them and the place where the action was taking place. When I saw my friend Justine, I told her, you don't see me, pretend I'm not here. She didn't know what was going on. All right, so I shut down communication because she's turning things off on her phone. But it's actually more precise than that because she says she turns off the location so people won't know when I'm close to them. And that's really the issue. So if I am close to somebody, like if she was really close to me, I would never know it. She would never share it. Wow. So that would make it very hard to have a close, intimate relationship with anybody. Absolutely. And we see that explicitly stated later on. Uh, And she says to her friend, Justine, you don't see me. Pretend I'm not here. So even her friends don't know who she really is. Wow. That's really intense. I feel sorry for her. Okay. Next part. (laughs) It all looked like a thriller movie. James and I had a rented apartment and hotel room, sort of paid for, for our action. James was the leader of this action. We were enemy number one of this master criminal. Everyone else was kind of drowned out, unaware of what was taking place. And no one knew what his actual plans were under the guise of his regular activities. I don't know if it was a nuclear bomb going off or something like that, but it was big. There was to be a lot of destruction. Then something happened. James, my partner, got lost in action somewhere or screwed up something, and I took control of the action. From then on, I managed it myself. I knew I had to count on myself to complete this action. Oh, my God, Michael, that's so sad. Yeah, so we know what it is now because she said there was going to be a nuclear bomb. And uh, we live in the age where we have the nuclear family. And so the nuclear bomb is the destruction of family. So dad was really destructive in the family. And he was, he was an alcoholic and all the things that go with that. And so she's now working on these issues, looking at the stuff. Um, We see, because she says my partner cannot help me, I'm on my own. So I feel like I'm on on my own in life. Now, here's a distinction between uh, impact of masculine energy and feminine energy. Feminine energy would be more like, I feel alone. Masculine, and you know, nobody, nobody loves me. I'm, I feel alone. Masculine energy is you're on your own, which is there can be plenty of people around me, but nobody cares or, or would help me if I needed help. And, and that's pretty much the distinction. So she calls out the distinction here. I'm on my own, even though, even though I have a partner. And she says, James was a leader. So she's a spiritual leader too. Um, she has a lot of skills and gifts of her own because of the issues with that. But um, she definitely feels like she can't trust others. She doesn't feel safe. Uh, and she says these words in the dreams, you know, like, I can't count on anyone. And that's really sad. So it means that dad impacted me so much so that even today, I don't feel like I can trust anybody, especially men. Wow. <laughs> Very intense. 
Alrighty, let's continue. Previously, however, we had to play with everyone to get the information we needed to save the situation. We couldn't be honest with anyone because everyone was on the other side, the side of this girl's father. All right, so here again, everybody's on dad's side. So it means as I go through life today, I see a reflection of my dad in those people. And there isn't a reflection. It's what she sees. So I don't trust anybody because I see everybody being connected to him, even as an adult. And now this is a subconscious thing. Maybe it's conscious in some ways. She's very aware of the impact of it. She knows that she doesn't trust men and has issues there. But she now is looking at, okay, why is this the case? Because how can a person I've never met make me feel like I can't trust them? It's because of dad. You can't, like, when, when you shrink your world down to what it was like when you're a child, there are two people in it, at plus you, mom and dad. And so your sample size for men, men that are important, the only ones important in your life, is one, dad. He's the only important one for quite a considerable time. And we build our world and our view of the world based on how he, he is. And all men are going to be like a copy of him in your eyes. And so I don't trust men because I couldn't trust my dad. Wow. That is so sad. I love how clear this stream points out everything once you explain it. It is so crystal clear. All righty, we need to continue. There was a man with long hair. To get information from him, I pretended to be close and flirted with him. It was somewhere in a restaurant or bar. I felt like I was having sexual intercourse with him in the hotel corridor. <laughs> it was strange because I remember there was a closeness between us, part censored by Michael. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. It was graphic. <laughs> okay. This is a way to distract him from noticing that I'm an agent. This is how I convinced him to be on my side. I saw seducing this guy was as a job to be done, not as a betrayal of James, because the whole task was very important. That's it. The situation was fast paced, like in a James Bond movie. So this is the part that you even said earlier. You you were like, could it affect her this way? So even when I'm intimate with somebody, I hide who I really am. And this to her, it's all part of I'm an agent. This person thinks we're close. So she's very aware that the other person is unaware of how she really feels. But um, again, the way to look at this is dad destroyed my ability to have intimate relationships. That's the problem. And of course, that's what she's working on. Wow. OK, next. <laughs> I knew Justina would be confused because I was a bit invisible, blurred, as if I didn't fit into their reality, as if I was there from another dimension. OK, so quite simply, I don't fit in. I feel like I'm on the wrong planet. Um, and like that's again because childhood is so bad. It's like, why did I come here? It starts off with why did I come here? And then it's like, yeah, I have to be in the wrong place because it's not meant to be like this. There's a part of us knows it shouldn't be this way. I should be loved. I should be supported. I must be in the wrong place. And of course, she will admit that, that she does feel like she's on the wrong planet. But again, it all starts started in childhood, very early days. So it's like day one and two are really super important for setting up this feeling for the rest of our life, unfortunately. Wow. At some point, Justina realized I was here to help. And she tried to help me. And this daughter also tried to help. She pretended to her father that everything was fine. Her father, knowing about me, manipulated his daughter and told her I wasn't allowed in. And if they saw me somewhere nearby, they should let him know immediately. She actually tried to help me, but I knew the stakes were high and I didn't want them to risk it. And I didn't want to risk their lives. I also wasn't entirely sure whether they were really aware of what was what they were doing for me or whether they were double agents. I felt that maybe they wanted to help me, but I knew that I had to do it my way. So wow, Michael. <laughs> having to do it your way is a masculine energy imbalance statement. Like I'm the only one who can do it. Like if I'm working at my job and there's people that I delegate tasks to, 
I'm probably going to redo what they do because I'm the only one that can do it. That's a masculine energy imbalance. But it, it, it's not just that this is baked into the person when they're born. It's not. It's a reaction, a defensive reaction to a trauma. And so here we see dad kept me out, tells the daughter that I wasn't to be allowed in. So that's going to be something simple in childhood, like this is my area of the house. This is my office. This is my living room. You're not allowed in while I'm drinking and watching TV. Something like that's happened. And she feels that rejection. And then, of course, the the sadder part is that it looks like everything's OK, because at the start, she says they're Justina and the daughter were trying to help me. But then she gets to the point of, but maybe they're double agents. So I want to trust them, but I don't know if I can trust them because they could be double agents. And again, this is how bad it is for her, that even when somebody is close and she does let somebody in, it's still destroyed all because of dad, because they can only be double agents for dad. Wow. And she's worried about them risking their lives. So that must have been how intense it was for her growing up. It, very dangerous, very scary, all that sort of stuff. But now looking back at it, it's still going to feel scary and still going to be horrible. There's going to be lots of anger and tears working on this. Yes, yes. All righty, moving on. I was supposed to disarm something, cut wires. It was a large building and a large hall or even a business park. This place was in danger or the danger came from this place. I tried to get there and save the situation. Basically, it was about his daughter. The most important thing was to save her from this. She was supposed to be manipulated into something. She was supposed to sign something or make some decision. And that decision had to happen quite quickly. And that was the point. Totally like a movie. So it's very simple here. Uh, it's up to me to disarm myself. Um, and it's, again, it's working on the issues back in childhood because the daughter's involved. So I've got to lower my protection and make it that people can get in without me blowing up or whatever it happens to be. Wow. Okay. Final part of the, of the dream. It was very important to me that this girl didn't lose faith and trust. When they suspected that this father was doing something wrong, I wanted them to remain confident in this belief so that they don't get confused and manipulated by him. I wanted them to know that I was there and that I was trying to sort everything out. The key for them not to lose faith in what they sensed and believed about him, even though it was new and probably shocking to them. And that's the end of her dream. Oh, what a dream, Michael. Absolutely. And she says, uh, it's important that I don't lose trust or faith. Well, that's that's what the sentiment of this last part of the dream is about. But you can see the contradiction here because it's all about I don't trust, I don't trust. And then it's like, oh, these people not to lose, <laughs> not lose faith and trust. Totally the, the issues that I have. But that's what she's working on. So it's like I need to restore confidence and belief in myself as well. That's also the the end sentiment in the dream. So it's a really sad dream. It's really powerful in its message because it's so clear. All dreams really are in a way, but it's so clear. Um, and when I analyzed this for her, it really hit home. Uh, so much so that even later that day, she wrote a, a long email about how it had uh, unlocked things that in a deeper way than she ever thought possible and memories had come back to her and so on. And, and she was really thankful, even though this is obviously a difficult journey. Um, but that's why we do what we do. I, I love doing this work and I love seeing people change. So we get impacted, but we're meant to get impacted. But then we're meant to work on ourselves later on in our lives and remove the negative impact and then move forward healed in our lives. And we can do that. Uh, most people probably who listen to the show are into the personal growth space and working on themselves uh, but unfortunately, it's a it's a minority of people, even though all of us need to do that fully. One third of what our life purpose is about is healing issues, healing traumas from childhood, because we're meant to heal those. We're not meant to just stay damaged. Yeah. Imagine what her life will be like when she heals this. She'll be able to actually tell people how she feels and be honest. And she'll feel confident and secure in herself and new that she can rely and trust on others. What other aspects? I mean, there's so much in this dream. 
We don't always know exactly what's going to heal. Uh, We just know that something is. And so we look at the end of a healing process, a healing journey, because we don't do it the way counselors in America do it, which is not right, which is to like you're, you're in for life. You're going to be working in a program for 10 years. We are not meant to have counselors. Uh, you know, they're great. It's the best thing in the world, but you do it for a very short period of time, get healed and then live your life on your own. If you were meant to have a counselor, you'd be born with one, just like a guardian angel. You'd have a Jiminy Cricket that also counsels you all the way through your life. We don't have that because we're not meant to have it. We're meant to heal ourselves and live our lives without leaning on somebody else as a crutch. And um, of course, that's a bugbear. It's not even what this dream is about, but we are meant to heal. That's it. And we can heal. We are designed to heal. Humans are able to evolve. So whatever issue you've ever been in, you're strong enough to work on that issue and, or whatever amount of it you can and heal and grow in some way. And that growth is what we get to take back with us to the spirit world. That's the whole point of it. Um, if we don't work on ourselves, then we don't take the growth and then we can look at it again in another lifetime, which is exactly what you do not want to do. All righty. So do we have time for one more dream, Michael? We do not. That was phenomenal. I really enjoyed, even though that was such a hard dream, I really enjoyed her playing the secret agent and going through and picking up the rocks and finding out all the different things that the dream was telling her. Amazing. Yeah, I love the dream. And I love the dreamer's attitude towards the dream and the healing. But um, yeah, every so often we do that on the show. We'll do a long dream like this, break it down. Um, and you can see so much about the about the person from a single dream. It's astounding the level of detail. And we've glossed over some stuff here. <laughs> like it's you can take that as a given. But uh, that's our show for this week. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye everybody.